Hey guys, and today I'm, I'm about to play some Sonic Mania. What's up my friends? My name is Kim and today we are going to be talking about Ganon Stout. If you like true crime like I do, then go ahead and hit that subscribe button. So I wasn't going to do this video until the trial was over, but I started looking into this case and there is just so much information that I didn't feel that it would ever be able to fit into one video. So I'm doing like a pre-trial video and then I'll do a, a later video after the case is concluded. And maybe I'll sneak in a video here and there just because this case is so fascinating to me. Letitia Stout has done everything in her power to incriminate herself. And so it's almost not the crime itself, but her personality is comical. What happened to Gannon is unimaginable. It is the worst that could ever happen to a family. So I don't want to minimize that. Just a brief explanation of this case. If you haven't heard of the Gannon Stout, Letitia Stout case, Letitia has been charged with murder of her stepson, Gannon Stout. So in today's video, what I want to do is just go through a timeline of events in chronicle order in the way that they actually happen, not the information as it came in, as it trickled in. For me, I like to do cases that way so I can see this happened, this happened, this happened versus this information was found from back here. It's just how my brain works. Hopefully you guys can follow along in, in this order. So this is all the information we have as of today, April 3rd. There is constant information coming through. Letitia, she doesn't like to go silent for very long. So even though that this is information to this to date right now, it doesn't mean that more things aren't going to happen because this woman is something special and you'll see as we go what I'm talking about. So on January 26th, Letitia records Gannon crying because he had burned the carpet. The video is completely disturbing. I'll play it a little bit later. I got it from Plunder and I will link it below for you guys to check out. I don't ever want to hear this video again. It's completely awful, but I think it's important to understand the depths that Letitia will sink to to try to prove her innocence. In the video, Letitia says, I'm freaking out. She's asking him if he burned the carpet on purpose. And of course he says no, and I pinky swear. It's heartbreaking. But like I said, I want to play that a little bit later. This just sets the stage of what happened the day before Gannon went missing. It is believed that this is what sparked everything. So I want to mention it at the beginning, but she didn't post this until later on just to prove her innocence, which was just more incriminating to her. Just keep in mind, Gannon Stout was reported missing from his Lorson Ranch home on January 27, 2020. So the video was created a day prior. Letitia had interesting Google searches between January 25th and January 29th. Let's take a peek at those. This information throughout this video is directly from the affidavit, which I will link all of my sources below as I always do. So check those out. That will have a lot more information because there's so much information. This video is already gonna be a million minutes long. What Letitia viewed, I'm just looking at my laptop. So on the 25th, this is the day before the carpet. This is the day before anything. Find real military singles. I'm overdoing all the work for my stepkids and their mom doesn't help. On the 25th as well, if you aren't involved in your kid's life, you are shitty. Another one on the 25th, why should my husband choose me over family? And then we get into the 26th, the day of the incident, the candle incident. It's crappy some parents don't care for their kids or buy them presents. Another one on the 26th, parents are those who put their kids before their needs. Okay, so we can see some resentment building up in Letitia on the 25th. So this is a couple days before anything happened. On the 26th, the day of the candle incident, my son 
burn the carpet how do i fix it and that was at 12:09 a.m so this was later in the evening and then she did another google search um smoke from fire affects the humidifier help and then into the 27th because of course it's midnight uh, Colorado lo law for kids staying home. School is out. Is it okay for my kid to stay home alone? Uh, later in the 27th, son is sick. Can he stay home? So as you can see, her, her Google searches are basically mirroring her thoughts, basically. I mean, as we all do, is showing that she's doing some interesting Google searches. On the 28th, after Gannon went missing on the 27th. So on the 28th, what is the process for a runaway, a runaway child? Gannon, as everybody described him, was a kid that was well behaved. He never ran away. He wasn't a troubled kid. So the runaway theory that Letitia came up with was out of character for Gannon. It, this is nothing he's ever displayed or anything close to what she was stating. All right, so now that we reviewed some of her thoughts that went on her Google searches, let's just go into a timeline of events. So Sunday the 26th. So Letitia has changed her story over time. So in this video, I'll kind of breeze through some of her different theories or whatever. I do have to mention that part of her Google searches, she also looked up, it's not here, but she also looked up moving to Los Angeles you can't move here looked for low-cost moving websites so she was looking for a way out or at least investigating ways to leave the marriage Sunday January 26th Letitia says that she met with alleged rapist Aguardo near a construction site police do not believe this story and she changes it anyway so we will just kind of move on. But she claims that Gannon knocked over a candle, burned carpet, and why she called Eduardo was to fix it. And she gave him the garage code and he would be able to fix it the next day. Letitia claims Gannon is up most Sunday night into Monday morning with, a, with stomach problems. Monday, January 27th at 4.37 a.m. Letitia tells her employer her stepdad was killed after being hit by a car and that she wouldn't be at work. She's actually fired from this job, but she doesn't know that she's fired. And, and she's fired because of discrepancies that they found on her application, but she doesn't know that, so she's calling in. But what's interesting on the way that she called in is the fact that she said he was killed. Like, isn't that a little overkill? You could have just said, my son's sick, I'm gonna stay home. And she sent this in a text message as well. She didn't call. So yeah, she could have just said that he was sick. That would have totally done the job, but I think she had killing on her mind. Letitia then informs the school that Gannon will be out that day. Gannon did not go to school and the school had him marked as absent and excused absent, so that was done. Between 8.13 and 8.17, Letitia takes, a, or both times, she takes a picture of Gannon sleeping in his bed and she sends this picture over to Al and Al is Gannon's dad, Letitia's husband. At 10.16, neighbor surveillance shows Nissan Frontier, the red truck with Letitia, and presumably Gannon leave the residence. Letitia leaves cell phone at home locked between 9.56 a.m. and 2.45 p.m. All day long, Letitia does not have her cell phone, but then at 10.37 a.m., a text message was sent from Gannon's phone. It, we don't know who had Gannon's phone, if Gannon himself sent this message, or if Letitia sent this message. N nonetheless, there was a text message sent to Letitia's daughter. Her name is Harley Hunt. And the text message said, Tisha left phone at home. If you need her, text me. So again, this could have been Gannon. This could have been Letitia. But the fact that she said Tisha left phone instead of hey, your mom left the phone. I don't know, I just think it's interesting verbiage for a kid. At 12.06 p.m., Al Stout sends a text message to Gannon that says, hey, buddy, 
it breaks my heart. It just shows how much this family loved Gannon. He was just checking on him. He knew he was in trouble. So he, I don't know, it breaks my heart. Anyways, during this time, Letitia travels to a Petco on North Nevada Avenue. This Petco is not the closest to our house, but it, she passes like two of them to get to this Petco on North Nevada Road. At 11.22 a.m., Letitia completes her purchase. Gannon is not seen on any surveillance footage. He didn't go into the store, and so far we don't know if he was seen in the car that day. So as of right now, he's not seen on video surveillance. That doesn't mean he wasn't there, but so far that's the information. So her whereabouts are unknown between 11.22 when she left that pet co and 1.22, which is two hours. But at exactly 1.21, Gannon's phone responds to Al and the message reads, can I play Zelda at least? And Al re responds and says, not today. It was sent at 1.21 and Letitia was caught on camera at 122 checking out of Petco. So I'm interested to find out if there is, if there's video footage of her standing in line perhaps, just waiting for her turn and she sent this message. We don't have anything in the affidavit to support that and it could have been Gannon. If you can tell where I'm leaning, I'm almost leaning that she sent that and he didn't, but just because of the two hours that are missing and it'll make more sense in a little bit. At 1.22, Letitia makes another purchase at Petco, which is bizarre. Two hour, exactly two hours in between. She does one checkout and then she does another one. Apparently she bought like three dog coats. It's just bizarre purchases. At 1.43, Gannon's phone searches can parent find my cell phone if it's off at 2 14 p.m investigators believe gannon was murdered by leticia after this time stamp at his residence more specifically in his bedroom based on the affidavit so they return the vehicle returns about 219 there's some delay in their ADT system so the timestamp it could be a little bit off by 10 minutes at 215 or 219 p.m. vehicle returns what appears in the video is and this is a neighbor's surveillance again sees Letitia get out they presume Gannon was on the other side of the truck and he can't be seen but it doesn't show him you don't see him it I've watched the video several times I don't see a shadow I don't see that he got out of the car and when Letitia got out of this car she was on a mission right she jumps out the doors flapping all open and she she is walking kind of on snow so she's kind of walking a little bit like head head first and so it looks and she's kind of like darting it typically if you're waiting for a kid or another kid is in the car anybody's in the car you kind of wait for them you know so you can walk in together or you know make sure they have everything or whatever but she she's not waiting for anybody she's running in the house this is all my opinion take it with a grain of salt i don't think gannon was there at that time but this according to the affidavit they believe he came back to the house. The ADT motion detection sensors in the house show no movement between 1016 and 1019 in the house because her and Gannon had left, so that makes sense. At 2.22 p.m., they presume that Gannon and Letitia entered house. Lena, Gannon's sister, was at school, and Letitia's daughter, Harley, was at work, so there wasn't anybody there. At 2.30, in an interview with detectives in February, Letitia tells detectives that she's being raped by Aguardo during this time, which is total baloney. During this time, the ADT motion sensors show movement between upstairs and downstairs. The garage door is open 10 times. Letitia is running in and out from the basement to the garage, to the basement, to the garage, to the basement, to the garage. And when she heads up to the garage, she sets off the living room motion detectors. So there's a lot going on in this time. And then at 2.45, 
Letitia un finally unlocks her phone. Mind you, she hasn't had her phone all day since 1016. And this woman is glued to her phone. She's like a Facebook maniac. So she, like most of us are, if we're away from our phone all day, that's pretty much the first thing that we do when we get home is check our messages. And for me, I'm like, oh, I, I'm thinking I'm gonna have a million messages and it's nothing. But she didn't check her phone when she first got home. You know, some time had gone by and then she finally checks her phone. Again, this isn't typical behavior. She's typically on her phone a lot. So keep that in mind. At 2.15, Letitia claims this is the last time she saw Gannon leaving the residence to go play with a friend. So at 3.15, Gannon allegedly says, I'm going to play with a friend, see you later. Now this is the same kid that stayed up all night, couldn't go to school, can't play video games, but he can go play with a friend. Lena, Gannon's sister, returns home from school. Letitia tells her that Gannon is asleep in her bed, don't bug him, and tells her to go outside and ride her bike. And so that's what she did. So from 3.30 to around 3.40 3.45, surveillance video from the neighbors shows Lena outside riding her bike. At 3.41 to 4.20 p.m., several text messages are being sent between Letitia, Harley, the daughter of Letitia, and her husband, Gannon's father, Al, the dad. At 3.55, Al Stout sends a message to Gannon's phone again that says, hey buddy. Once again, he's just checking on him, see if he's okay. And this wasn't read until 7.40 p.m. Detectives believe that Gannon was just already deceased. He, he just wasn't there with us anymore when this message was open. So this kind of supports the earlier dialogue that Letitia had Gannon's phone and she potentially was reading and responding messages. At 4.42 p.m., Harley, Letitia's daughter, arrives home from work. She has a white Jetta. She picks up Lena, Gannon's sister, and they leave and go to the dollar store. At 4.52 p.m., Le Letitia sends a text to Harley asking her to pick up items from the store. She asks in the text message for carpet powder, two things, baking soda, and trash bags. At 5.14 p.m., a receipt time stamped for 5.14 shows the purchase of trash bags, baking soda, and vinegar. It was later found in Letitia's car the receipt was. This is just another example of how Letitia incriminates herself. She didn't throw away the receipt, but rather she took it in her car with her. I, I have no idea. But anyways, that's where they found it. Uh, the detectives believed that Letitia cleaned up the mess that she had left behind from killing Gannon. And these are the supplies that she used to do this. On February 1st, detectives found blood presence in Gannon's bedroom, the hallway leading to the utility room from his bedroom, the u utility room itself, the staircase landing upstairs, the pathway to the garage, and the garage area itself. At 6.55 p.m., Letitia calls 911 to report that Gannon is missing. So this was at almost seven o'clock. He's re he's reported missing. Letitia says that he was supposed to be home at six, so she grew concerned at seven, an hour after he's supposed to be home. The detectives show up at the home at 10.09 p.m. Deputies respond they're unable to locate Gannon. Deputies observed a Volkswagen Tiguan was backed into the garage. Deputies go into Gannon's room. Detectives later compared the body camera footage of the room compared to the photo taken earlier in the day. They show Gannon's bed was had different bedding and it, the bed was also moved against the wall where typically it wasn't flush with the wall. Tuesday, January 28th, this is the day after the incident, at 5.14 a.m., Letitia texts a babysitter, and this is what the text reads. This happened after 3.30. We talked to him when he told, be home by 6 p.m., the sitter. Someone posted he wasn't at school either. 
Letitia, he had to go to the doctor for his stomach, but there was no record of him going to the doctor that we know about. Letitia, but he was here in the afternoon. Sitter, where did he say he was at? Letitia, honestly, I don't keep up with his friends. And I believe that when Letitia said that she doesn't keep up with her, his friends was probably the only truth that she told this day. Moving on. At 8.30 a.m., a receipt shows Letitia rents a 2019 Kia Rio from Avis Car Rental in Colorado Springs. At 8.48 a.m., Letitia texts Harley to pull her white Jetta into the garage. It is believed that she asked her to do this to conceal evidence in the garage. At 8.50 a.m., Letitia picks up Al from the airport and then heads back to the home. I'm not sure if 8.50 is the correct time. Anyways, she picked Al up from the airport. At 12.57 p.m., search on Letitia's phone, can Nintendo find my Switch? They couldn't find the Switch anywhere, if that tells you anything but that's one of her searches. Between 4 and 4.15, investigators ask Letitia for Gannon's toothbrush for DNA. At 4.19, Letitia texts Al. They are asking for our son's toothbrush, but say nothing is wrong. Letitia, something isn't right. I think they're hiding something. Al responds, who, the police? Letitia, yes, they asked for toothbrushes. Al, hmm, what do you think they're hiding? And then there's no response that we could see. And then at 7 p.m., Letitia picks up the, the Tiguan she left earlier at the airport. And at 7.02, a receipt shows Letitia leaving the airport with the Tiguan. Between 7 to 12 a.m., detectives believe she used the Tiguan to dump Gannon's remains between 8.30 to 10.20 p.m. Location data from the Tiguan shows vehicle was in the area of Highway 105 Perry Park Road in Douglas County, Colorado. Phone data from the Tiguan shows that the vehicle was north or USAFA and south of Douglas County. So she's in that area and that will be important later. At 9.16 to 9.28, data from the Tiguan shows driving into a rural area of Highway 105 and Perry Park Road and then driving out. So Harley, the daughter, she has been, throughout she'll give Letitia rides back and forth. So they did know in the affidavit that Harley's phone pinged at home, so she wasn't with Letitia, so she's not a suspect or with her at this time. But Harley does leave the residence at around 1026, 1030, and the detectives believe that she picked up Letitia near Powers and Carefree, that's the roads, and then Letitia left her car parked there. At 1045, Letitia makes a statement to investigators via text message. Letitia is very much um, a texter and her message is, what do you want from me? Question mark. Because I have nothing. One of your very own leaked to me what you guys were doing. I did nothing or am being set up. I'm not really even sure other than being told that by other blue with El Paso, I was told I couldn't go home to sleep and on top of that, men were sent to a home where a minor female and she was forced to stay there not to even have good. What? Every conversation that is said, even at this moment, I hear inside, what do you want from me? It's interesting that she says she can hear. I don't know if Harley's reporting back. How how does she hear everything? Did she may have like a little they have those little like baby monitor things that are maybe she has something like that. I don't know. It's just a odd statement, but anyways, she can hear everything. She's a compulsive liar, so to, you know, that's important to know. So the detective responds and he says, "Come in and talk to me. I would just like information to find Gannon." They're getting frustrated. She's not helping. She's not wanting to aid in anything. She's in defense mode. Wednesday, two days after Gannon goes missing at 9 a.m., 
another car was rented, which was a Kia Rio. So she was picked up by someone in a white Jetta, presumably Harley, because her daughter drove a white Jetta. So most likely Harley picked her up on January 29, 2020. And at 11.30 a.m., surveillance video catches Tiguan at car wash with potential blood on the back bumper. So she's getting the car wash. Harley took Letitia to pick up her car that's parked where she left it the night before. Mind you, she already rented a different car. I don't know. So she goes and picks up this car. She heads back. She gets the car washed. And then she heads to the police station because she had a scheduled interview with the detectives. But of course, she was two hours late for this appointment. And it was important that she got her car washed before she met with them when her stepson's missing. Gotta get my car washed. Letitia arrives at EPSO office for the interview with the detectives two hours late. Letitia brings several pieces of paper with her with notes for the interview with the detectives. The Tiguan Letitia's vehicle was wet, obviously from the car wash. The car was seized that day during the interview. So during this interview, Letitia claims she was held at gunpoint right by a Hispanic man named Aguardo and Gannon was abducted by the male after he finished raping her. Claims men were in the basement when Lena came home that day but she was allowed to greet Lena. She greets Lena, tells her to go outside, and then she comes back in and then is raped again. I don't know, 3.30 to 3.40 p.m. She claims she may have hit her head and she blacked out. Claims Gannon jumped on the rapist's back. Claims the rapist threw Gannon across the room, held him at gunpoint, and demanded a suitcase and a cardboard box claims she cleaned up the area. Detectives offer Letitia a, a, a rape exam. She denies it. Detectives seize Letitia's phone at the end of the interview. And then Letitia starts sticking tissues down her pants and then claiming she has chest pain and shortness of breath. And then she was transported over to a hospital. Why was she sticking tissues down her pants? Like, what was that? that if you guys have any theories about what the whole tissue thing is about, I just find that it's so bizarre. Like I even went and asked my niece, like what, why would somebody stick tissues down their pants? Oh, to hide evidence. Maybe she was wiping her eyes. Oh, okay, okay, okay. That could be it, that could. So Letitia is now at the hospital. You know, she has this mysterious chest pain during the interview. She had to cut it short because you know, she's having problems. Well, she mysteriously gets all better and ends up leaving. Like they didn't discharge her, she just left. She just left. She just wanted to get out of that interview, presumably. And so then her daughter, Harley, picks her up. During this time, the investigators got a search warrant. They find multiple carpet brushes with the carpet fibers on them in the dishwasher at the Stout's residence. Investigators locate an empty gallon of vinegar. Then Letitia runs a 2020 Nissan Ultima. Investigators put a GPS tracking device on the Ultima. And then at 2.14 p.m., Letitia texts Nicole, who is presumably the homeowner. It's kind of confusing how the affidavit is written, but when we came back inside from the smoke, there was blood on both of us. I don't know what to do. I was scared. I would get unknown word out about it and don't know if he should go to the doctor. I kept trying to add the candle thing, but Albert kept saying it was small and minor. I was scared the basement was smoky and when I threw the cover everything we both had blood. <sighs> These messages are hard to read. You don't understand how it is to be a stepmom. Okay. Friday, January 31st from 4 to 515, 415 to 515, Letitia heads back to Douglas County near 105. Park Highway Road in Douglas County. She's making several trips to this area. 
Detectives believe she went back to make sure Gannon's remains were not seen near the road and evidence of the body was covered up. She's just covering all her bases, making sure whatever. Letitia does this interview, which I will play just a small clip of it, but she just acts like she's such the victim. She can't talk about Gannon, but let's talk about me. Here's a clip from that. You are? I am Tisha Stout, which is Gannon's stepmother. Uh, you've been a part of the investigation since the very first time. You were the last person to see him. Is that right? Correct. Uh, what, what did you see when you last saw him? Well, I'm not allowed to talk about anything with the case. I would more so be willing to talk about how the community needs to have faith and continue to work together and not make these false accusations like the things that have been said that I've disappeared from the community. I haven't been there to help, but there's lots of reasons behind that. Saturday, February 1st, detectives find possible traces of blood on the rear of Letitia's vehicle, the Tiguan, uh, an area near the glove box in the passenger seat. Over the next few weeks, detectives conduct more thorough searches through the Stouch home, and a Blue Star agent was used to find the presence of blood in Gannon's bedroom. The hallway leading to the utility room from the basement, the utility room itself, the staircase leading upstairs, the pathway to the garage, and the garage itself. Once again, there are traces of Gannon's blood throughout this house. In Gannon's room, they suspect blood is, is found seeped into the carpet, through the carpet pad, and to the point that it stained the concrete below. This home had never been owned by anybody else. It was a new development and they were the first to live there. So it wasn't from old tenants that lived there. So just keep that in mind. Blood stains and blood spatter were located on the wall in, the, in this area as well. They found 50 droplets of blood that were found on the wall near Gannon's bed. Gannon's mattress has red stained on the carpet and blood cast is also on the wall. Experts say blood stains on the wall were likely created by either gunshot, blunt force, or a stabbing. Suspected blood is found behind around the edges of an electrical socket. So you know how you have the white cover or whatever? When you remove that cover, behind it there was blood there so she had cleaned up around it but it seeped behind on tuesday february 4th a neighbor brought forward a video of gannon leaving the house with Letitia, but there isn't evidence that Gannon came back to the house on the video when the husband saw this video he started to cry and he said she lied she lied about the time and gannon didn't go to his friend's house al is now very suspicious He's hurt. This was his wife. He trusted her. And now he's given proof that he's been deceived and Letitia was not being honest with him. And so being upset, he, he started to cry. And what's interesting about this video that the neighbor had is that he offered it to Letitia and she said, no, she didn't need it. So there's that. So this is Sunday, February 9th. This is the day that Letitia leaked a video of Gannon crying. I'll play the video. It is heartbreaking. <sighs> Fast forward if you don't want to listen to the video. Um, it's, it's pretty heartbreaking. <laughs> Well, devastating. Initially, Scott, I can't lie, when the TMZ information... Gannon, I promise this is the last time I'm going to ask you. I'm going to freak out, okay? Are you sure you didn't do it on purpose? He did it. Okay, he promised. He promised. On purpose. Pinky promise. Pinky. Okay, all right, so, listen. Listen. We're, all right, I'm, we're going to have to sell stuff to fix it. Okay, so okay. we figure out what we gotta sell. We can sell the sofa, we can sell whatever, because we gotta get it fixed so the lady don't be mad at us and kick us out of the house. Okay? You got it? Again, you know, she asked if he did it on purpose, and this is all around this stupid candle 
that was knocked over and burnt the carpet. It's so dumb. So it's said at the end, he says that he, it sounds like he says I'm bleeding. So Wednesday, February 12th, investigators start focusing their efforts on D Douglas County. This is where Letitia keeps on going back and forth to. So Thursday, February 13th, investigators start monitoring the phone calls between Letitia and Al because they're not living together anymore. Al's ex-wife Gannon's mom is now staying in the house and Letitia is not staying there. And so these fo phone calls are being monitored. Al knows that they're being monitored, but Letitia doesn't. And so in the affidavit, it claims that Letitia's story kept on changing throughout. Letitia on one of these calls states that Gannon was burned with the candle to the point that his skin was bubbling. And so that Gannon peeled the burn off and wiped blood on his bedroom wall. Al didn't ask about any blood on the wall. And this was Letitia stating this, giving voluntary information about some blood that might be on the wall that she had cleaned up because of this burn. Letitia makes another Facebook post stating that at the end of the video that was leaked on Facebook that ended with Gannon saying I'm bleeding, she explained that that was because Gannon cut his foot on a two by four because Al does woodworking in the garage and Gannon tripped and cut his foot. Pass and blame, whatever. Now it's, now it's Al's fault, whatever. Friday, February 14th, a phone call between Letitia and Al shows more stories. These are the stories. When EPSO came to the house on 127, uh, the day that Gannon went missing, that she claims the abductor was still in the house and she tried to tell the deputies that somebody was there. EPSO deputies checked the entirety of the home and no additional person was located. So, whatever. She, she was raped by Quincy Brown now. This is the whole new person at her home and Brown abducted Gannon. And she knew Brown's identity because she saw a paper with his ID card that fell out of his pocket. Letitia sent a photo of Quincy Brown to Al via text. Quincy followed her to Petco, she claims, and at some point was lying in the middle of the road in front of her when she stopped not to run him over. He jumped in the car and made her take him home where he allegedly raped her. And then she says that Gannon was riding a bicycle in the area, fell, hit his head, and it was then when Quincy abducted Gannon. Brown was driven by a man named Terrence, now another person. She tells the officers if they check that Douglas area that it would be futile. Why would searching anywhere not be important? They, you search everywhere. You, you are not a cop. Why are you telling them it's not important? It is important. It's always important. Anyway, she's trying, what she's trying to do, in my opinion, is she's trying to get them away from that area because that area has incriminating information. So police believe that Dow also fabricated this story after seeing Brown's picture in a lineup and the, the Pikes Peak most wanted fugitives. It was, it was listed and he was one of the names. Saturday, February 15th, investigators located a piece of particle board during their search. It had a stain that appeared to be blood. The blood profile matched Gannon. Gannon's blood was found near Highway 105 Perry Park Road. Investigators think that Letitia used this particle board during the disposal of Gannon's remains. Letitia tells investigators that she told Al that Gannon had fell off his bike because she thought that's what he wanted to hear. So now she's covering up her lies. I told Al what, you know, what he wanted to hear because he's not gonna believe me what I say anyways. What? You're talking in circles. Letitia told Al over the phone that the blood in the corner of Gannon's room was a combo of hers and Gannon's. She said that the abductor raped both of her and Gannon and was present with EPSO came to the house that night. Sunday, February 16th, 7.28 p.m., Letitia told a female, which her name was Tila Cummings, that she had given Al false stories because she knows he won't believe anything, she says. True. 
Very true. Monday, February 17th, Letitia told Laura Abernathy that she was thinking about flying out to Colorado to take a lie detector test to prove her innocence. She said, they think I'm still in Colorado. She wasn't in Colorado. That's what that tells me. At 4.11 p.m., Letitia told another unknown female she is going to take a lie detector test, but the test wouldn't be admissible in court and no law enforcement would be present. Tuesday, February 18th at 10.14 a.m., Letitia called a phone number associated with, get this, fakepolygraph.com. Letitia tells Collar she never, when she called them and said, hey, I never received my confirmation for my test I paid for, this man on the phone said that he would send her an email. So an hour goes by, Letitia calls the phone number again and says, hey, I haven't received those results. And this man on the phone said um, the report was blocked by management because the questions wanted on the text were illegal and it showed illegal activities that the company um, has the right not to send it. And so Letitia's like, what do you do now? Just delete it and go on about my life and you keep my money? And the male's like, mm-hmm, yep, yes indeed. Letitia says, okay, gotcha, thank you, bye. Letitia, what are you doing? The detectives reach out to them, to the website, and ask for the questions she was trying to get answers for. Here are the questions here. So the questions are, do you intend to answer the questions regarding your stepson truthfully? Yes. Is your birthday August 4th, 1983? Yes. Did you participate in any way in causing harm to your stepson? No. Did your stepson return with you from the home? Yes. I find it very interesting that she asked that question because I don't think he returned. The affidavit says he returned. I'm no one to go against what the police, they know way more than I do, but in my head, I am stuck that he did not return. I'll explain this a little bit more later, but I find it interesting of the five questions she asked, that was one of them. Out of all the questions, that was one of the questions that she needed to prove. Interesting, right? Did you participate in any way in causing the death of your stepson? No. So if, if Letitia didn't have anything to hide, why was she paying for a fake polygraph? Why didn't she just take a real po polygraph? February 28th, Judge Raffalo, hope I'm saying that right, probably not, signs a warrant for Letitia's arrest. Yes. Monday, March 2nd, Letitia Stout had fled. I mean, she had already fled to South Carolina, so she is found there and arrested in South Carolina and is brought back to Colorado. She was charged with first degree murder of a minor, tampering with a deceased body, child abuse, which ends in death. When she's being transferred back from South Carolina to Colorado, Letitia slips out of her handcuffs and attacks the deputy. It was only supposed to be a 48 hour trip, but they were delayed by 12 hours because this deputy had to go get treated for his injuries in a Kansas hospital. It was unclear what the injuries were to the deputy. I think we'll find out more during trial, but she slipped out. She was trying to escape. So yeah, it's unknown of what his injuries are, but I believe they will come up in trial. So I'm interested to hear, you know, is it just standard they go and get checked out or was there like, like did she gouge his eyes out? Like what, how, why did he have to go to the hospital? Friday, March 20th, Gannon Stout's remains, his remains were found in a suitcase near Pace Florida. On March 22nd, Letitia was given nine more charges, first degree murder after deliberation, and eight more counts for committing a crime of violence, one of them being with a gun. So I believe, I could be wrong, from everything that I, that I watched, it supported this, but for whatever reason, I'm not convinced. She had used several different weapons. There was a blunt force trauma, something to do with a knife or something, and then there was also a gun. 
and it, it was like three different like she had three different weapons is how I understood it I'm no expert we'll find out more during trial I'll give my theory in a little bit but well let's let's keep going so around April ish um Letitia's in jail now and she asked another inmate for a broom handle to be able to break the window so she can escape the inmate instead reported her. Letitia is writing a letter to this other inmate for this. Tell, tells her not to tell anybody that she measured herself and, you know, she knows she can fit through. What? And then she also writes a letter Letitia does. This is why I'm saying Letitia incriminates herself. She documents everything. Like she leaves so many traces behind her. I, she's so ballsy that she thinks she can get away with it. And it's just like, I'm glad that she's doing it the way she is because this will just get justice for Gannon. She is just putting that extra nail in her coffin by doing everything that she does. So she writes a letter to her daughter and says, don't worry if I'm not in jail anymore and they can't find me, just don't worry about it, okay? In this time, Letitia is dropping weight, right? She's lost like 15, 20 pounds. Well, maybe not, maybe she's lost like 10 pounds. When I see the pictures, I don't think it's that dramatic, but some other people say it's pretty dramatic, but jail food is not good, trust me, I know. So I think she's trying to pull a Bundy and of course, she's considered a flight risk at this point. So she's in shackles. They have their eye on her. On August 12th, Letitia writes the judge to, to state her constitutional rights are violated. I'll link the page below, but she says she doesn't have access to her lawyer and she knows it's a pandemic and she feels her calls are being recorded, which they are. She thinks her food is being poisoned, her peanut butter, she's getting messages in her peanut butter. Um, she gives a history of the flag, perhaps to move the judge, which the judge was not moved. She basically is asking to be let out and that is a big fat no, nice try. She wants bond, they're not giving it to her. February 19, 2020, a closed conflict meeting with the judge was going on and it was about her attorneys. In a late, later letter, it states that she feels her, her attorneys are in cahoots with the prosecutor. She wanted to get a new, she wanted to get new representation and they denied it. They had no grounds to appoint new attorneys to her. And I don't know if I mentioned this, but bond was denied. She had no bond and they denied the fact that she could get new attorneys. So on February 24th, they had an Aguardo hearing that she wanted to represent herself. And they approved it. And who else did this? Bundy. I think Bundys are idle. The serial killer Ted Bundy took the stand in his own murder trial. He represented himself too. If you'll recall, Bundy went to law school. Bundy ultimately convicted and sentenced to death in Florida. A sociopath isn't someone that you can just peg and say that person's a sociopath. With this decision, she was given more time to review discovery. And so it delayed things a couple months because apparently there's 26,000 pages of evidence and there's 1,800 pages of discovery. So good luck with that, Letitia. Good luck. March 8th, 2021, she writes another letter to the judge. And I'll read this one just because this is super sketchy and I think it may come into play later and it's the newest development. So some of you may or may not be aware of this letter. So the letter reads, conflict hearing info, Judge Werner. This was uh, dated on 2-21-21, but the, the timestamp for the judge is March 8th. On 2-19, this is me reading the letter. On 2-19-2021, I was unable to talk with Judge Bain about my conflicts with my defense team due to, number one, the actual privacy of the booth and the transport over. I explained in detail to him expressing my concerns of privacy. Number two, I had a very difficult morning mentally because I am not 
mentally well. One of the main issues with my attorney is the, the lack of ability to gather evidence. Due to this, I find little value in the term expert. First, they were unable to obtain my medical health records from Charleston, South Carolina, when I finally paid a firm in South Carolina to obtain them. In 2016, I was diagnosed with blank, which I believe is bipolar. And why I say that, I'll enter a clip from uh, another interview that she had where she said she had bipolar and she wasn't being treated for it. So, uh, you know, like she's probably 18. Honestly, I was just, you know, not getting treated for being bipolar, not being treated for you know, a lot of things. I believe that is supposed to say bipolar, but it's redacted, so we don't know and received treatment before work for over 28 hours of care. The school district even provided extra services and later let me medically resign due to this ongoing reality breaks. In 2018, I was hospitalized in Canada, crossing the border for two days, plus completed more OP outpatient treatment when I returned. I tell you this is, I tell you this because it sets the stage for why I cannot work with my attorneys. I signed release forms for them to get all the information so they would have a better understanding of why I am all over the place some days. All over the place some days. Okay. I asked them to use the info from my non-biased doctor who worked with me more than two hours, but instead they sent a lady who was clearly an actress and friends with the DA. She spoke about him in an unprofessional manner, their history, and his election. Now, I'm sure all of this was true, but I thought she worked for the court, not the particu one particular side. My attorneys did this to make me look like a perjurious individual. Instead, it, it was malfeasance on their part. I have included several reasons to support my claim as I keep a timeline of these conflicts. Communication is broken beyond repair. I, I explain these issues to Judge Bain, including the lack of access and visitations in complete detail. I'll leave that letter below. Inconsiderate of evidence. Since March 2020, I asked my attorney to preserve the GameStop footage to locate the Texas police officer whom I spoke with and to get the cruise passenger list. Instead, they spent months contacting my family for integration. When asked certain things, they kept saying they will let the investigators know. One year later, same answer. My evidence. I haven't physically seen any while being held at the CJC for one year. Yes, COVID. But inmates were still being held as our constitutional rights were adjusted. Looking statute and evidence. They overlooked the competency statue about video recording. Human error? Okay, but this happens often with evidence in which me, the non-expert, has to provide corrections to evidence. Sharing info. These were, they were texting my family and giving them info that they should not have causing several disputes. That be a defense because it's my understanding that you actually did do it. However, I will protect my bio son and I will protect the drugs and violence documented from my stepson. I don't know what any of that means. I have no idea what that means. I'm so confused. My bio son? I, I see nothing that she has a son. And then I will protect drugs and violence documented from my stepson. I, I, don't, I don't know what she's trying to say there. And this could be her efforts to show that she's not well, that she's losing it. It could be, I, or it could mean something and the evidence just it will find out during trial. The truth is, okay, back to the letter. The truth is the court is holding the wrong person and for the wrong crimes. This whole process has been nefarious from denying me a, an attorney, threatening me in the bathroom away from cameras to confess, taking advantage of me being delusional, threatening my other kids' freedom or else, etc. I am going to keep making it known, sir, just how much the state has been 
in this wrongful incarceration. I will continue to be an advocate for myself because I am not a murderer and the level that the prosecution goes through to promote a wrongful con conviction is absurd. Truth is, they could see a video from someone else and they would dismiss this person as a lunatic. They have far too much invested in the wrongful incarceration to admit they were our wrong. For these reasons, and because my defense team is in cahoots with them, I am left with no other choice but to represent myself. Denying me my rights under the Constitution has happened throughout this process from the detectives, the jail, and now my legal team. Every day I'm getting worse mentally. Every day I'm getting worse mentally due to the inadequate representation and being held hostage from a crime I did not commit. These are my conflict issues and my reason for asking to go pro Z as always. Thank you for your time. So this is her letter saying this is why she wants to represent herself. I have to mention that Letitia has gone through two psychological evaluations, both clearing her of being mentally sound to be able to go through or to move forward to trial. So two evaluations. Standard is one, she got two just to make sure, and she is competent. So the next court date is on May 20th. So right around the corner, May 20th is the next court date, which is an evidentiary hearing. Uh, this day will bring way more to light. I am so waiting for this date. So this is where we stand as of today. So in my opinion, I think that, well, we know that Letitia is just not a smart person, but she knows how to manipulate and work the system. That is a skill she definitely has. She, but she is her own worst enemy. She likes to be in the spotlight and worries about what other people think of her to a, a degree that incriminates herself. And she incriminates herself to say I'm innocent and to prove that she's not a bad person, but then then it's just worse. She writes these letters to the judge. Her defense team is saying, be quiet, don't do it. But then she does it. She's trying to escape jail. It's just like, sit down, shut up, and let her defense team do what they do. But she can't do it. She just cannot do it. Again, it's another nail in her coffin. So keep up the good work there, Letitia. I think she's trying to get a mistrial. I know the prosecutors are smart enough to be able to figure this out and is watching their every move and hers as well. The evidence as stated above seals Letitia's fate, but it's a loophole that will free her at this point. That's the only way she's going to be free. And she will try to convince you the sky is purple when clearly it's blue. She will make things up on the fly. And definitely her words cannot be trusted. She's a cold, calculated, callous woman. And she has darkness radiating in her eyes. I mean, it's bad. She is in stating that she has mental issues. She was swaying and doing bizarre things in a Zoom meeting, which I'll play a clip of that. It is so bizarre. Shit. it. And 
and I'll leave my source below so they can get credit. And she's continuously telling the judge that her mental state is deteriorating. I'm not mentally well. She says it over and over in that letter that I read you. So I think that's just another way for her to either later back out of defending herself that maybe she thought, I'm going to do this and prove a point. I'm going to represent myself. But then as, as time is going, she's like, oh, but my mental state. And so instead of looking foolish, that she's going to go with that, that she's not mentally well to be able to back out of it. Or she's trying to get a mistrial. I'm not sure, you know, later this will come up as she's found guilty that says, I sent all these letters that I wasn't stable, so why did they let me represent myself? I'm just interested to see what, what, what happens. But my personal theory, um, take this with a grain of salt, whatever you wanna do with it, it means nothing. I think the assault started in Gannon's bedroom and Gannon was bleeding, and there's evidence of that, of course. Um, Gannon is wounded, so Letitia tells Gannon, we're gonna go to the doctor. And so they load up in the car. You can see that he's limping. You see that he can't bend down to pick up something. I'll show a clip of that. In the, uh, in the beginning of the video, Letitia is carrying a backpack. And I, I believe that backpack, that the backpack is filled with evidence. Perhaps the switch is in there. Perhaps some other items are in there that are incriminating, but she has a backpack with her. She loads it in the car. She moves the car back up. Gannon um, is seen limping out. He's described by the neighbor as being, uh, what did he say? That he looks drugged. He doesn't look like himself. And he drops something out of the car. He looks at it. Letitia walks by, she picks it up for him. So that, that gives me the impression that he's wounded and he can't pick it up. And so they end up loading in the car. There was some delays and some pulling forward and stopping and whatever. And then when they pull out of the driveway, in the back of the bed of the truck, you see something bouncing out of it. It could be a suitcase, could be a cardboard box, it could be Nothing. I don't know, but if you ask me, I think it's a suitcase. At this point, we don't know. They leave. They go to Petco. Gannon is too injured to go into the store, so he waits in the car. Possibly he's laying down in the car because he's not doing well. She has left her phone at home. She turns Gannon's phone off, and they disappear for two hours just enough time for them to go to that Douglas area. I believe at this point, Letitia shoots Gannon and places him in the suitcase and leaves him there, returns to the Petco to be seen on camera again, goes home and cleans up the scene. I don't think Gannon returned back to that house. The affidavit states otherwise, but mind you, the affidavit was written before they actually found Gannon. So with all that new information, I believe during trial, the theory could change. I believe that Letitia went back and got Gannon's body, leaving intentionally or not leaving evidence there, like the sheet of cardboard, the particle board, and the sock with Gannon's blood on it does a bunch of shuffling of cars. She disappears at times, possibly moving him. And the final place where he's found is Letitia dropped him in Pace, Florida. I don't know, does that sound logical to you guys? Am I way off track? Please let me know what you guys think. If, if you guys have a different theory or what I'm saying doesn't make sense because I'm convinced that's what's going to happen. So I will 100% be watching the whole trial and most likely I'll do an update video along the way if you guys are interested in that. But check the comment section below for updates and theories as we go because I think it's gonna be spicy. I'm sure it's gonna be spicy. Well, if you guys have made it this far, you might as well go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Or if you're already subscribed and you wanna check out some more videos, check out my Captured Killer playlist. 
uh, that has all my true crime videos on it. But I want to thank you guys so much for being here. I've been really enjoying this series. It has been very interesting. It's nice to get to know you guys. And so I love you guys to death. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in my next one. Bye!